Man, that's a great name to go along with a sermon here. Just want you to know I ain't said that. Yeah, we got children's church going on right now. If um, you're new here and you're wondering when it's going to start, it's right now. See them all piling up to this door. They're going to take them by there and teach them the Word of God. Um, if you would be turning to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 this morning, verse 4. That's a great song to go along with what I'm preaching this morning. I just set that up, put that on Austin's heart. Um, we're going to talk about don't shame his name this morning. Don't shame the name. The name, the name above every name. Let's stand together and honor reverence for reading God's word. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 4. It says, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we preach, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time use we flattering words, as you know, nor cloak of covenants, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherished her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God, your witnesses in God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that you would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just pray that you would take your word this morning, Lord, and open it to our hearts. And Lord, you would help me to decrease, God, and you would increase, Lord. And I just pray that you would fill me with your spirit, you'd speak your word this morning, God, and your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um. Sometimes, sometimes, you know, you got something on your mind that you need to do. And you, you make a list of things that you have to do to get that done. You know, a lot of us are familiar with that. A lot of people, you like making a list. And, and if you're like me, you like checking it off. You know what I'm saying? It ain't just good enough in your mind to know you've done it. Sometimes you like checking it off on your list or, or putting a line through it. And you know, it's gone. And, and so sometimes whenever you're preparing to go get a job done or preparing to do something, whatever it may be, you have a list of things that you need to do to get them done. But then there are also, on the other side of that, there are some things that you need to avoid sometimes so that you can do whatever you need to do. There are some things that, without a doubt, would keep you from doing what you needed to do. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning, is three things that you need to avoid if you're not going to shame the name of God. If you really want to live the Christian life, and I mean people that are really sincere this morning. I don't just mean people that want to come to church and and not go to jail and be a good citizen. And not, I'm talking about people that really want to serve God, really want to just bring glory to God's name. And that's the number one goal of your life. And God is the centerpiece of your life. Then there's three things that you need to avoid. The other folks that are half-hearted and lukewarm, I mean, you're at Ladder to See in time. I mean, just like Ladder to See in church, you're not at a place where God can deal with you. You know, hot or cold, God can deal with you. When you're smoking hot, He can use you. When you're cold... I mean, he can deal with you. But when you're in the middle, kind of so-so, you know, they ain't, they ain't nothing to do. He just says, spews them out of their mouth. I mean, I, and so this morning, you know, if you're there, if you're lukewarm, you need to get hot for Jesus Christ. Amen. You don't need to get colder. That ain't answered. You need to get hot for Jesus Christ. That's the thing you need to do this morning. The thing you need to do is get your priorities straight and know that not shaming the name of Christ and bringing glory to God is the thing, number one thing that needs to be in your life. That's where all this starts. But once you get to that place, there are some things that you need to avoid. And we can see in what um, Paul talked about his time at Thessalonica and what he done there, how it could help us as Christian people to know how to do things and to know some things that can keep you from doing that. And the first thing I want you to look at in verse 9 and 10. And um, for you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we would not be charged by any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. You're witnesses of God, also how holy and justly and unblamably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. You see there that he said they worked night and day. They did what they had to do. You know, I mean, they had to do some things to help support themselves. 
got, you know, because, you know, the church wasn't able to do it at that time. Completely disappointed. So they worked night and day. They went in there and worked night and day. The first thing you've got to avoid is laziness. Amen? All right. Amen? You can't be lazy and serve God. You can't be lazy. I'm telling you right now, you can't be lazy and, not, and just not bring shame to Christ's name. Somebody who's lazy and not sold out and not willing to work, they're going to bring shame to God's name. It's just a matter of time. It is a matter of time. I mean, think about it. Think about at times when in the church, and God's you know, called out people, set aside, that there's times when we have a lack of people to work. Think about how that looks to the world. All right? Think about how that looks when you've got other things that are more important to God. Think about how much shame that brings to Christ. That you're not willing to work. Listen, it brings shame to God's name. Think about it. We claim that we love Christ with all our heart because he died on the cross of Calvary for us and he made that ultimate sacrifice for us. Think about it looks to the world when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary and then you won't serve him. Yet you claim to be a child of his. Think about how it looks. I mean, it looks terrible. It just looks awful to the world. And you know, people come up with a million reasons. A million excuses. But that's what they are, is excuses. When it comes to serving God and what God has called you to do, you can't make any excuses. Because God has given you the ability, He's given you the opportunity, and He gives you the provision that you need to do what He's called you to do. He ain't sent you out there to do something that you can't do. So there's no excuses when it comes to serving God. There's none. That's unbiblical. That's unbiblical. There are no excuses. When God calls you to do something, you don't need to be lazy. It brings shame to God's name. Think about it. Think about how much glory the people that are serving God bring to God. Think about that. I mean, a lot of times we focus on the negative side of things. And sometimes that, I mean, that needs to be addressed, addressed. But listen, think about the people who bring so much glory to God because they serve Him relentlessly. They see the times that um, you have things going on in your family. They see the times that you're in um, physical hardships. You know, your health may not be the best in the world. They see the times that you may be, you know, economically not as well off as you were before. But yet you're still serving God. They see all those times. They see those times when you're persecuted and yet you still get up. And they see those times and those days when you're wore out and you're tired of it and you're sick to your stomach of all the bull that goes on everywhere. And you still get up and you still come and you serve God because you know that He's worthy to be served. That brings praise to God. Amen? I mean, when you go serve God and it's all roses and everything's going good, that's good. That brings an amount of glory to God's name. But it really takes it up a notch whenever you have to face adversity and the things that you have to face. And when you go out there without making excuses and you just get after it and do what God has called you to do, regardless of what your neighbor's doing on the pew beside you, regardless of what your neighbor's doing down the road, regardless of what the church's doing down the road, no matter what they're doing, you're doing what God has called you to do. Because that's what it boils down to, and that's where we'll be on Judgment Day, is standing there with you and God alone. Amen? For what you've done. And so if you, don't, if you want to avoid bringing shame to the name of Christ, you can't be lazy. Because most of the time when somebody don't do something, it's because they're being selfish or they're being lazy. Because that's like I just said, the rest are excuses. The rest are excuses. Anything he's called you to do, you can do. Amen? Amen. God's got your attention this morning. I can tell you listening. Amen? It's getting all up in your kitchen early, ain't it? We was talking about this early. Some people like getting up early in the morning. Some people like staying up late. I like early in the morning a lot of times. Amen? I like early in the morning. So I, I'm really, I'm, I'm here, 11 o'clock, I'm wound up, ready to go. Some of you still ain't woke up. Amen? All right, but listen, I might get on your nerves a little bit. I, I'm preaching the Word, okay? I'm preaching the Word. Just listen. Second thing. All right, listen to this now. It's lack of love. A lack of love. You cannot have any lack of love in your life for anybody. And serve God without bringing shame to his name. You can't do it. Listen to this. This is tricky now. You've got to pay attention. From here on out, you've got to pay attention. And this is something very important, not just to everybody, because it is important to everybody, but 
to this church. Especially important to Walkerville Baptist Church. From here on out, the next two points are very important for this church. Listen to this, verse 8. It says, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have in part in you, not the gospel of God only, but also unto our own souls. Also our own souls. Because you were dear in us. Let me read something out of Hebrews chapter 12. Very familiar set of scriptures. Verse 13. And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. But let it rather be healed. You understand what that means, don't you? When something's not right, when somebody's lame, and then some part of their body is not right. And what we try to do a lot of times is we try to avoid things. We try to avoid things instead of fixing them. Instead of completely fixing them. And right here in Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, he hits that dead on when he says that. He said, that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. It ain't just good enough to beat around something and to stay away from it. It's got to be fixed. It says, follow peace with all men. With all men. You understand when I said what ago? You cannot, you cannot live the Christian life and not bring shame to Christ if you got out with anybody. This is all men, don't it? That means lost, saved, whoever. And it says, follow peace with all men and holiness. I don't care what you say, you are not living a holy life if you ain't right with people. Things ain't right between you and people. You are not living a godly life. And it affects you and everybody around you. This is now. I mean, God is, God is really perfect in the way he says things. He explains it very well. Look at verse. It says, without which no man shall see the Lord. That's important, ain't it? He put some importance on that, didn't he? Look at verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any... Listen to this now. He wants you to look diligently. He don't want you to just blow over things. He wants you to look diligently at your life or some things not right. Look what he's telling you to look for. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. All right, here's where we're gonna here's where we're gonna take something that's really an unbiblical way of doing things, and we're just gonna rip it to shreds right here, okay? There ain't just ain't gonna be any doubt about what's right and what's not right here. Look at this, verse on um, 15. It says, "Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you." Let me ask you something. Where's a root? Most of the time, where's the root at? Underground, ain't it? Can't see it, can? But it springs up. It's there. You know, when you're just walking by, you really don't see it. But it's already there. And he said, it springs up. And it's going to come up. Things are going to come up. When you have problems between you and other people, things are going to come up. The devil's going to make sure of that. What that does, you know, the situation ain't caused the wrong. The situation has brought out what was wrong in your heart. Amen? And that's what he's saying right here. It was already there. There's always some problems inside of you, but this situation has brought it out. Spring forth. What it says right there. Here's where, here's where most people say it's at and where it stops at. Springing up troubled you. Most people don't want the rest of that verse. Most people say, well, I got a problem with them, but that's just between me and them. Or that's just my problem. No. That ain't biblical. That is not biblical. There's no doubt this is very plain. Read the rest of that verse. Look what it says. And thereby many, many be defiled. Amen? I mean, it's like a bad virus. It spreads like wildfire. It affects you. It affects the people that go to church with you. It affects people in your home. It affects people trying to lead you. 
It affects everybody. And that's a lack of love. Is exactly what that is. I'm going to tell you something. I want you to think about this now. We don't put it as a lack of love. We've even, we've even been deceived to the point to where we feel like we're doing a good job. Amen. That's what we say. Hey, listen now. I'm telling you, it's fitting to get all up in your kitchen. Amen. Everybody's kitchen. We say it like this. Well, you know, I don't really hate them. That's the way we say it. You know, I just don't like them. I don't want to be around them. I'm talking about people talking about other church people. Yeah, I really don't hate them. Let me, just, let me just explain to you why you say it that way. Because everybody and their mama since they was in kindergarten has been taught that God, won't, God won't, won't, don't want you hating nobody. So what you're doing is you're being politically correct in the church or religiously correct. You really do hate them. You just say, I don't like them because you can't say, I hate them. See, at least the world's honest about it. At least the world out there says, I hate them. But us, see, we just play games and we change words around. You understand what I'm saying? You hate them. That's why when you get around them or you start talking to them, you can't stand to be there. That's a root of bitterness. Amen? That's hatred. I mean, there's a lot of people I don't like. I mean, take the, take the church side out of it and people out there in the world I don't like. There's a lot of people I don't like. But, I mean, I don't get mad and want to just rip their head off every time I get around them. I don't sit there and just smile when something goes bad for them. Huh? See, that's what the devil does. He's an accuser of the brethren. Ain't that right? Amen, all you scholars, he's an accuser of the brethren. All right, so you know what he does? Listen, you can read in the book of Job. He goes up there and he lays it out, son. Hey, you been in something? He been watching, he's seen it going on. He's up there, God, you know what so-and-so's doing? You know what he's doing Why he does it? I know he does it. What do you think he does while he's saying that? When he talks about how you messed up this week and he's accusing you before Almighty God, what do you think he's doing? You think he's frowning when he says that and he's crying because he's broken hearted? What do you think he's doing? Enjoy it, ain't he? Enjoying, smiling. See, this is what some people around here think. They, this is what you're thinking. Honestly, you're so far off base biblically, this is where you're at. You think, all right, well, when we get to heaven, God's going to straighten you out. So you honestly think that while God is sitting there bringing judgment on one of your brothers at the judgment seat of Christ, that you're going to be sitting there with a smirk on your face? That's how you act. That's exactly how you act. Tell me it ain't so, and I ain't saying no name, but I can tell you a bunch. And it was here when I got here, and it ain't gone. And this church ain't going nowhere until it is. And I don't mean pushed and iced over where new people and people around can't tell it. I mean when it's dead, killed, dead, assassinated, gone. That's what's got to be done. It's a hidden hatred. And it's a stack of cards that's just waiting to fall. I'm telling you. And this church ain't going nowhere until it's dealt with. Some of you sitting here, my gosh. It's the most loving church I've ever been to. I ain't talking about that. I ain't talking about being welcoming. I ain't talking about being kind to one another. I ain't talking about that. Just because if they call and need your help, you go and help them, don't mean you've got it right. That's just a good old boy way. I mean, your grandpa would roll over in his grave if your neighbor called you didn't go help him. That ain't nothing to do with being affectionate and loving and want to help them and want to see them succeed. And being their greatest cheerleader. You want me to tell you how to kill those bad feelings you have between your brothers and Christ? You become the person you dislike the most, greatest cheerleader. You intentionally do that. You pray for them more than anybody else. 
And you help them more than anybody else. You say, well, I can't do that. Well, just stay out of God's will. That's what you're doing. Because God said you can do it. He said in 1 John, I read it last week in this church, that God is greater than your heart. That if your heart condemns you, that God is greater than your heart. It ain't just good enough to be a good old boy. Church ain't like out there in the world. It ain't like being at work where you just get along with people to the point where you don't fight with them and then you can get by with doing it. This is spiritual. It's deeper than that. It grieves the Spirit of God. And that's what it takes to move people. That's what it takes to see people saved. That's what it takes to see a community change. That's what it takes to get Obama on his knees before Almighty God. It's the Spirit of God. Moving in God's people and the Spirit of God quits moving when God's people quit forgiving and quit loving like they're supposed to. Amen? I hope I'm making this clear enough. Amen? I hope I am. Listen to these verses. Matthew 22, let me read this to you. You heard there in in Thessalonians where they said... Paul didn't want them to mistake what he was saying. You remember what he said? He said because they understood that it wasn't their words that they were speaking, but they were really the words of God. Do you understand? So I want to make it very clear this morning. This ain't just something I come up with and piled up in here with. This is God. And what God has commanded us to do. Look at this in Matthew 22, verse 36. It says, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the God with God, thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. I believe, honest to goodness, I say before Christ himself, this church excels at that. More than any other I've ever been around in my life. There are so many people in here that love God with all their heart. And there are so many people in here that serve him with all their heart. That I mean, I'm, when I was talking about the lazy part, I couldn't think of somebody who was lazy in our church. I just couldn't. Everybody's so willing to help. Everybody's so willing to work. And I see people sacrificing so much to serve God. Loving God with all their heart, with all their strength, with all their soul. That's the first and greatest commandment. But listen to the rest of this now. I'm telling you, you probably like me, you probably missed this before, okay? You got right there and you quit because most of the time, you know what? When Daddy was telling me a list of things to do, you know which one I concentrated on the most? The first one, amen. I want to make sure I got that done. You know, the last one on the list he might understand, but he said this is important. You need to get this done first. And guess what? That's the first thing I'm doing. All right? But listen to what he says in verse 38. He said this is the first and great commandment, but he didn't stop there. In 39 he says, And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now that's a bunch of stuff hanging on those two commandments. And what he's really saying in it is in there, if you'll fulfill these two, then you'll be doing all the rest. That these are the two that all the rest, the principles that all the rest are built upon. Now listen, look at what he said. He didn't say, if thou shalt tolerate thy neighbor to where you can sit with them in a building without cussing them out. That ain't what he said. He didn't say that. He didn't say that if thou shalt go help thy neighbor if he needs your help. That ain't what he said. That ain't it at all. He said, look what he said. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as what? So let me ask you this. So when we go talking about the person you dislike the most in this building, do you treat them with the love and the affection and love them like you love yourself? Come on now. Ask something. Does it make you happy when bad things go on in your life? When tragedies happen to you? Does it make you happy when you make mistakes and you sin and you do things that you shouldn't do? No. See, I tell you how I like to be treated. I love it when people text me, tell me they're praying for me. 
I love it when I know somebody disagrees with me, but they still treat me with enough respect and love. I like it when people enjoy when I walk in the room. Amen? That's what you want, ain't it? Don't you want people to be happy when you walk in the door? That's how we want to be treated. That's how if we had our way, we'd be treated. Amen? Now, now some people can take it to another level now. Some people would just want it all to be about them when they walk in. You understand what I'm saying? That, I ain't talking about going that far. I'm talking about people loving people like they want to be loved. Loving people like they love themselves. And see, that's what I'm talking about when I say a lack of love. Is that it may be a quarter of the way full. And not all the way. That ain't good enough. That don't get you there. That don't do one thing spiritually. And let me tell you something. If you are in that kind of place and you're in that kind of situation, what you're doing don't mean a thing to God. Not a thing. You say, Brother Greg, that ain't biblical. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Let me read you something from 1 Corinthians. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity... I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and, could, and have not charity, I am what? Nothing. You see, I don't care how hard you're working in this church. I don't care what you're doing for God. If you ain't got love in your heart for every person in this building, if you ain't got peace with all men that Christ can give you and do through you, it ain't amounting to nothing. I'm serious. I'm as serious as I can be. Ephesians 4, I want to read that to you. This is God's word now. This ain't Greg's. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. That word worthy, worthy of the name that was in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 a while ago, same word here, same Greek word. They walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness, listen now, and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Ain't it amazing that the first thing that God said after walking, talking about walking worthy of the vocation wherewith you called, the first thing he talked about was how you treat other people. And look what he said you needed to be. He said, lowliness. Now, why would you need to be lowly and meek? Because you can't go around saying, well, I don't deserve this. And they deserve that. You understand what I mean? You can't say that. You, gotta, you can't have any pride about you. Yeah, I mean, you can't love everybody and have any pride left in you. Because there are people that are going to push it as far as it can go. You understand what I mean? There are going to be people that do you as wrong as they can do you. 